Para onde eu tenho que olhar? <risos> Essa coisa de híbrido é... Para cá? Para cá? Tá. Bom dia. É... Ok, vamos lá. Tiago, tudo bem? Tá. Então tá bom, gente. Bom dia. É, obrigado pela presença. Estamos aqui reunidos para mais um centro de estudos. Dessa vez um centro de estudo especial, porque integra um evento que está acontecendo aqui no Instituto. É, quero já agradecer muitíssimo a Marli e ao Maurício por nos permitir estar aqui no centro de estudos com vocês. É, bom, é, esse centro de estudos ele é especial porque ele acontece em meio a um evento que estamos tendo aqui, que é um evento que é, chama Toward the Development of a South American Research Network for the Surveillance and Control of Sexside Resistance Mosquito Vectors, que, é, que visa montar uma rede colaborativa da América do Sul para os estudos e a, ações relacionadas ao controle de vetores, essencialmente relacionados à, à questão da resistência à inseticida. Bom, então, é, com isso eu quero então agradecer a presença dos nossos participantes desse evento, que estamos aqui reunidos desde ontem, nossos colegas que estão aqui na plateia, temos colegas da Argentina, da Guiana Francesa, do Peru, do Equador, da Colômbia, de Venezuela, há outros colegas também interessados em participar dessa rede, recebi várias mensagens ao longo dessa semana. E é claro, esse foi apenas um primeiro encontro, mas vamos né, expandir a novos colegas. O Vansan vai falar melhor disso daqui a pouquinho. Mas, enfim, quero agradecer muitíssimo a disponibilidade. Também agradecer muito a, a participação aqui da nossa colega Audrey Lenhard, do CDC, que também permitiu a, a vinda dos nossos colegas e também ao IRD, né, que também está nos ajudando muito aqui a, a gente fazer esse evento. Bom, então eu vou fazer uma, uma uh, breve apresentação minha, que estou apresentando. Meu nome é Ademir Martins, eu sou pesquisador é, em saúde pública aqui no Instituto. Minha linha de pesquisa é em controle de vetores, é, principalmente as, relacionada a aspectos genéticos de vetores, e venho estudando há algum tempo essa questão da resistência a inseticidas, que por si só é um capítulo de evolução bastante interessante né, entre os insetos. É a evolução que a gente vê acontecer assim a olhos nus, então é um assunto bastante é, interessante. E é por isso que temos hoje aqui também, estou é, muito honrado aqui com a presença dos alunos da turma de Parasito 2, que estão aqui no, no auditório, é, que justamente para é, a gente discutir um pouquinho sobre esse tema. Façam perguntas para os palestrantes, viu? E o pessoal que está em casa também no YouTube, fiquem à vontade para colocar perguntas. Eu vou estar aqui atento no celular para poder é, passar as perguntas de vocês para o nosso palestrante. É, bom, eu queria também registrar aqui, agradecer a presença do José Bento, que é o chefe do nosso laboratório, e da nossa vice-diretora do Laboratório de Referência e Coleções Biológicas, Elizabeth Rangel, que também vem já colaborando conosco nessa empreitada aí da resistência inseticida, no caso com os flebotomínios, né, Beth? Bom, e, e é isso, vamos começar, eu vou, vou, vou então fazer uma apresentação do nosso palestrante, uma breve apresentação. É, ele vai falar em inglês, ele está aqui desde setembro do ano passado, ele já fala português, já é carioca, mas é, ele vai ficar mais à vontade agora falando inglês e ele vai falar devagar, não é? E assim todo mundo vai entender muito bem, tá bom? Bom, então... É, Dr. Vansan Corbel, ele é médico entomologista e pesquisador no IRD, que é o French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development, é, a, a sua unidade é em Montpellier, na França. É, mas agora ele é pesquisador, professor visitante aqui no IOC, desde setembro de 2022, como eu disse. É, Vansan é novinho, mas tem mais de 20 anos de experiência. É, em, no controle de vetores de, de doenças provocadas em humanos. Ele já publicou mais de 150 papers no, nesse campo e já fez mais de 30 treinamentos é, em programas de controle de vetores ao redor do mundo, né? na África, no Sudeste Asiático e também na região do Caribe. E vamos fazer muitos agora aqui na América do Sul. Né? É, Vansan ele é coordenador da, da rede global, que a gente chama WIN, Worldwide International Network, que tem a, 
o objetivo né, de monitorar é, e combater a questão da resistência a inseticidas em vetores de arbovírus. É, essa, é, e desde 2023, é, esse, começou esse ano, tem um novo projeto, um projeto europeu chamado Inovec, que, tem, que nesse projeto reúne 12 países e 21 instituições para desenvolver e promover novos métodos e ferramentas de controle de vetores. Bom, é, bom vet Vansan, muito obrigado pela disponibilidade. Agora é com você. Muito obrigado, Ademir. Bom dia, gente. So, eu, eu cheguei em Brasil em setembro de 2022. Uh, e, so, eu aprendo um pouco, um pouco de português, me falo um, um pouco. E, so, desculpa, eu vou falar uh, em inglês, porque minha apresentação é muito longe, hein, 50 minutos, e, e eu prefiro falar um inglês, porque é, é mais fácil para, para mim e para, para vocês, <risos> provavelmente. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Ademir Martins uh, Bento, uh, that leads the Lafica Laboratorio, for inviting me and for allowing me to be to work here in um, in Fiocruz. Also, EOC Tanya for hosting me and the institution for a couple, of, for I hope for a couple of years. And I also would like also to thank all the colleagues here from the, 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 the regions that came for these networks that Ademia talked talk about, that's, uh, that's with the intentions that we try to build networks in all the South America to study more the insecticide resistance problem in, in mosquitoes, okay? So today uh, I will make a presentation on insecticide resistance and try to give you some uh, highlights about what is the main challenge of resistance, what is resistance, what we face in terms of problems, uh, and also to try to address some, some gaps and also to, to give you some prospects for controlling mosquito, what's, what's new and what what's can be done to improve the surveillance control of, of the mosquitoes and especially the, mos the resistance mosquito that pose big problems. Um, mm, Está não funcional, não? não. Ok. Uh, just because I arrive in, in, in Fiocruz and I start working now in, in EOC uh, with my colleagues, I just uh, want to share with you some probably is there uh, to share with you some some of my a bit of my experience when I've been working uh, because it's also understand why I'm also coming here to work in on mosquitoes I starting my my to my my research after my PhD in Africa I've, I've been uh, recruiting IRD uh, and I've been working in France for uh, four years uh, leading a, a WHO collaborating centers for testing and evaluation of insecticides making some research projects mainly in France and in the Caribbean. Uh, then I had the chance to move and to study, uh, to move in Africa, to spend four years in Africa working on, uh, on malaria vectors and uh, evaluating uh, new strategies for the control and prevention of, of malaria in Africa. I was working with the University of Cotonou for a couple of years, working also on resistance in malaria vectors in Africa. Uh, then I, I went to Thailand, Southeast Thailand also, to, to lead a group, a, re a research group, to study also the, the vectors of malaria, but also vector of, of dengue and, and chikungunya in Thailand, but also in, in the regions. And I lead a pro an international program trying to also testing new methodology for, for control. So um, then I, could, I was back in France after in 2016. Uh, where I stayed six years or so, uh, developing different networks, the wind network, for example, and starting different projects like the EU project that we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, and after having an experience and expertise of malaria and arboviral uh, disease in different transmission settings, studying vectors, behavior, resistance pattern, in different uh, settings, uh, I, I decided also to come here to work uh, with my colleagues from, from, uh, from uh, La FICAV, uh, Ademir, uh, José, in order that we can try to better understand the emergence, cause of, 
of vector bone diseases and try to improve surveillance and control of these diseases in Brazil, but also try to make connection and work with the, the, the region. So you just understand a bit why I'm here today also and, and the, the, the purpose of my, of my visit. So one question I, I use normally more for teaching, but since there is a student here today, it's good also to, to, to ask, maybe they don't know. Uh, it's sometimes good to, before talking about resistance, know what is the most deadliest animal that, that we have on Earth. So someone knows who is the, which is the deadliest one? Ah, good. Okay, that one. Of course, the, the, the best killer in, in, in the world is not actually even the sharks, it's not uh, snake, dogs, even the human, uh, that's kill a lot of, of humans, is clearly the mosquito that are responsible for more than 700,000 deaths every year by, of course, transmitting different pathogens. And, uh, and clearly one of them, the, this guy, uh, Anopheles, uh, belonging to Anopheles genus, is just responsible for about 247 million cases of malaria, uh, mainly in Africa, mainly in, in, chil in, in, in children under five, and is responsible for about 600,000 deaths per year. So it's also before talking resistance, this is the real situation and the problem we face with mosquitoes. Um, here you can also see an overlapping, a map showing the, the distribution and overlapping of the global distribution of the main mosquito-borne disease that we, we have on Earth. This is a map that has been done by, by the wind networks and that it shows not the incidence, eh, number of cases, it's just so here the number of overlapping disease that we can face in a country from zero, no no uh, autochton transmission, up to seven diseases in the same places. And clearly, there is no data, no data were, were analyzed for Europe. Huh? But uh, here you can clearly see that there's really Africa, West Africa, and sub saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and also especially here in Latin America and South America, where there is a higher number of diseases that can be transmitted uh, in mosquito. Uh, and globally, we estimated that 80% of the world are at risk of one or more mosquito borne disease, so it's really a huge problem. Just in Brazil, it's good to remind some cases. Just in light last year uh, report, it showed that there was uh, 1.5 million dengue cases in 2022, about 100,000 uh, cheek uh, cases, 130K for malaria, and a bit less uh, on Zika. But you can see that this mosquito-borne disease is clearly a, a big problem, especially in, in Brazil and the regions. Why we talk about resistance is also because we, uh, insecticide resistance, is also because we use insecticide. And you still probably know that mosquito-borne diseases prevention still heavily relies on the use of chemicals for the control. And we have different kind of application, but clearly the main kind of applications are long-lasting nets, indoor residual spraying, larviciding, and indoor or out outdoor uh, insecticide spraying that really mainly use over the world to control the mosquito. One problem we face, you know, if we see well, is that globally, it's changing a bit in the recent year, but globally, all the insecticide that we use uh, uh, may have really limited number of mode of action, okay? For example, we use the parathyroids that target the sodium channels. We use it for long-lasting net, IRS, space spray. We use organophosphate and carbamate that target the acetylcholinesterases. We can use for a space spray, IRS. We have in insect grow regulator for larviciding, and now we use this kind of product for LLIN. And also Bacillus uh, sphericus, BTI, BS that we use. Globally, there is more insecticide, but now not representing a, a large amounts of insecticide that we use. So clearly, this is the main product we use. And one product, we have few mode of action. Few mode of action, that means we target the same, globally, the same target receptor in the, in the mosquitoes. One problem that we face, not today, eh, over the last 20, uh, 30 years probably, is lack of, of fewer investments in new chemistries, okay? And how we explain that, is because when you compare the market size of insecticide use for crop protection, agriculture, which is huge market here, uh, this year it has been estimated at more than 84 billions of dollars. We can see that non-crop protection, but even on terms of vector control, the proportion, the budgets, markets, 
uh, and use of insecticide for vector control is, is nothing. Clearly, that is not something that is really important. So two consequences, no investments in, in insecticide for public health, so mainly in vector control, we use insecticide that has been developed in agriculture, which we call the repurpose insecticide, we take them to use for a public health value. And also consequences over the year has been a drastic reduction in the number of US, European research-based companies investing in insecticides. Clearly, uh, we can count uh, maybe less than, than 10 now that's really actively uh, uh, work on, on, this, on these things. So, so clearly what we have faced over time is really simple to understand. I make it simple to understand for everybody. The challenge clearly is more and more resistance mosquito species by the use of same chemical over year, over year, over year. And in the time, less and less new insecticide for a public health use, even if we have, been, we have seen now in the recent year a, better, a, big, a bit more investment in new insecticide. I will talk about uh, this later. But uh, the, to change the trend is not taking two or four years. It has been a trend like this for 30 years, and we pay the consequence now of this problem. So, this is really simple to understand, more, 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 less insecticides, more resistance coming because of the pressure we have put on this mosquito with the same insecticides. Okay? And this is becoming really a, even a big challenge for public health that even the former WHO uh, director have called for urgent actions to prevent resistance spread, maintain the effectiveness of vector control intervention. Uh, in the short, medium, and long term. So that was quite recent that also in WHO report, malaria report, they start saying, oh, uh, malaria, anti malaria anti antiparasite, malaria resistance is important, but insecticide resistance is becoming a, a bigger challenge. Just to give you also evolution, of the trends of insecticide resistance of mosquito in the last 20 years, that is based, of course, on the reports we have. If you look at the data that has been reporting for insecticide resistance in Aedes mosquito, according to WHO classification, which red is a population resistance, uh, or yellow is suscepti it's a suspected resistance, and green is susceptibility according to WHO criteria. When you look at data in 2000, we were essentially report from Aedes resistance in Brazil. Then after a couple of years, more and more report of resistance came, 2010, especially in America, but also you see in Southeast, in, in Southeast Asia. And, and why this area is because probably the importance of arbovirus uh, transmission in these places here is really consequence, important. So more and more people have been working on, on resistance. And over time, you can see that the problem has been really, really important, where especially in uh, Latin America and Southeast Asia, where we don't find or really we, have, we don't find susceptible population or really, really uh, localized. Resistance has been detected in at least 57 countries and is probably underestimated because it's based on the reports that has been done, in, which is a bit old, 2017, so probably much more. Uh, and, uh, and of course, one consequence is Brazil in terms of distribution of resistance and intensity of resistance is really strong in Aedes mosquito, especially in Aedes aegypti. When we make the same work with Anopheles mosquito to see the, 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 the opposite strength, uh, Anopheles mosquito, we add, in, in, in contrast to Aedes mosquito, more data in Africa especially the first report of resistance that has been reported were essentially in West Africa and, uh, and South Africa. Okay, and over time, 2005, 2010, you have seen that the number of insecticide resistance population has increased, 2015 and 2023, the situation. Of course, what we can easily see is strong resistance in India, strong resistance in, in Africa, which is a big problem because malaria is essentially a problem, uh, uh, an African problem. Uh, and we also see strange things is here. What's going on? So we, it seems that clearly there is 
for the regions, uh, insecticide resistance is either low or no resistance or underreported. So we had this discussion yesterday as part of the network. Do we miss some information? Do, do, do we don't have any much problem of resistance? This is a question that we, we want to answer because clearly compared to the other regions is much lower. Okay? I try to look at other data, not from ER mapper now, but with the WHO treat maps. They also uh, get, you can find information on WHO treat maps about resistance. We have a bit more information if we look compared to, uh, to, to, to uh, the other one, a bit more data point that has been reported, but clearly it's not, there are more susceptible or less resistance population uh, compared to other regions, it's clear. But we have started seeing some resistance uh, in Anopheles albimanus, especially, essentially it's resistance reporting uh, in uh, Peru, in, um, in uh, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, Aki, uh, in all selected in a repeated failure of product to have achieved the expected outcomes, when of course we use the product according to label recommendation. There is different scale here, while here we really wait to see an operational impact while here we try to detect uh, resistance a bit oh. earlier. No, sorry. Okay, and actually us, with the scientists, the WHO prefer to work with this definition because this is uh, much better for us to study at this stage because this is, uh, uh, we can probably act more effectively on resistance when we detect the resistance earlier than when we wait an operational failure before doing something. Just also, I think, to talk a minimum about uh, selection of resistance, evolution of resistance and, and genetics things. So uh, what's going on in normal population? At the beginning, before any resistance, when we have a population which is considered as susceptible, eh, when you put a treatment, pop, you kill and you control your population by eliminating them and controlling them. What's going on when this guy, eh, still uh, the resistance mosquito, arrive in the population? It can arrive to different process, a de novo mutation, new mutation, right, that is developed in one side, or through a migration. That means the resistance is coming from uh, a mosquito coming from a, another population. Then when you start applying the treatment again, what will happen, you know, after generation and generation, this kind of mosquito will survive, will multiply together, and then after some generation, if you, you, know, you make the treatments, you have very low proportion of susceptible allele in the population, and this um, resistance mosquito invade and represent the majority. This is what's happened when we use and repeat an insecticide treatment in the population. And actually, we have been identified uh, different factors that can play a role in selection of resistance. Resistance can evolve more quickly depending on different things. I don't know if you see well the slide, but if uh, resistance will develop more faster if there are short generation time of an insect population, uh, if there is a dominance of the resistance gene compared to recessivity, uh, if the gene is monogenic, because the pressure of selection will be on one, si one target side compared to, to, to multigenic, uh, if there is important gene flow in population, that can also bring uh, a resistance allele in the population. And of course, for us, what is important is the insecticide selection pressure uh, that we put, the application of treatments, okay? So this is mainly the biological genetics factors that can contribute to increase the resistance, plus the human application of insecticide, but it can be also some pollutants. Hopefully, we have also some other factor in green that can also be used to to, to, to reverse the resistance, uh, we can be used, yes, in terms of resistance management. If the population, in contrast to here, have long generation time, low fecundity, uh, multigenic uh, resistance, okay, genetic cost, some resistance allele uh, are costly for the mosquito, so if you stop a treatment, this resistance may slow down because the population has lost this, this, uh, this gene. Eh? And of course, here, if we apply a good insecticide resistance management strategies, because then we can try to, to revert and try to minimize the insecticide selection pressure on mosquitoes. Also for, especially I think for students, uh, how the insecticide resistance works. Well, first it's good to remind that an insecticide always working before he kills a mosquito, he has to come in contact with the insect, penetrate the body. 
then to escape some detoxification process and due to the detoxification enzyme. Of course, some of the insecticide will be excretes naturally. Then, after all this process, it will be able to reach the target sites, especially in the nervous system of the insect, and then eliminates uh, and kill the insects. Okay? So what is actually resistance? There is different kind. All kind of mechanism that can block the resistance are, I think, summarized here. First one has been the behavioral resistance that has been observed a long time ago uh, with DDT and IRS treatments a long time ago in Africa, where some mosquitoes were escaping the contact with DDT. And more recently, we have found evidence that also the mosquitoes, um, uh, when we apply, for example, long-lasting insecticide night over two years' time, mosquitoes have changed their biting behavior. They may bite more outside than inside. We have seen that, that has been published. Or they will change the biting time more early on the morning that w than, uh, in, in the, uh, than in the evening. They change and ad adapt to the presence, for example, of long-lasting nets or insecticide treatments. This is um, mainly, uh, that has been uh, published and observed in Africa. One thing that also is not so well understood, but we have more evidence, is this cuticular resistance, you know, reduced penetration of the insecticide in the body that can be used by increased thickness of the cuticle or change in the composition of the cuticle. For example, in Anopheles mosquito, it has been seen that there is an increased um, proportion of hydrocarbons and also oxidases in the cuticle that also re reduce the penetration and cause resistance. One of the most famous mechanism, of course, that probably you know is the increased detoxification. Huh? It's metabolic resistance based due to enzyme P450s, esterases, glutathione transferases that will increase the expression, the, ex the, the detoxification of the, in of the insecticide. Some mechanisms are sequestration. That means the insecticide will be kept in the enzyme, but not specially detoxified. But it, it is captured. It is, is, it is in, the, in the enzyme, like uh, has been observed for GST, especially, and pyrethroids. And uh, one of the famous, the end, uh, a target site mutation, non-synonymous mutation in the gene uh, coding for a receptor of the insecticide uh, that will then change the susceptibility of the, of, the, of the receptor to the insecticide. Mainly, we have three keys mutation that has been published. ACE1 mutation for resistance to carbamate and organophosphorate, famous KDR mutation for resistance to pyrethroid and DDT, RDL gene that has been resistance to GABA uh, and some organocorine. Okay? And uh, we also now have more evidence about the microbial resistance that the mosquito have been found to also uh, host some lot of lot a lot of, of bacteria, and some of them are known to detoxify the insecticide. And some work that has been done recently in uh, in, uh, in in South America uh, by uh, Audrey here and this group and this collaborator also show a higher proportion of some bacteria that can detoxify the phenytrotin. So the, so this is something also that is a bit new. So you can see that these mechanisms are alone or can be combined together. Some mosquito can have all this kind of mechanism. So you understand why it's becoming difficult to control them. Just a, a discussion about the KDR mutation, because it's probably one of the most of, of, these, uh, of, of the target site and resistance mutation we know, especially in Aedes aegypti. Um, this is a mutation. There's actually different mutation in the sodium channel that has been identified. A lot, uh, more eight, uh, at least eight or ten mutations, but there is few of them that has been found to play really a role in the resistance because you have many mutations, but some of them that don't don't play a role in, in resistance. Especially here, uh, this one uh, V410L, uh, the valine to glycine or isoleucine substitution in 1016 position, and this one, which is really universal, the 1534C, uh, that are really playing a role in resistance. And this mutation has been found in many countries, alone or in combination, and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually uh, they are spreading. Something interesting to look at also is how this mutation work and impact on the susceptibility of the sodium channel to, to the insecticide. Some work has been done by the Japanese and by expressing a different KDR mutation alone or together in the Xenopus eggs, they try to understand the susceptibility of the channel after exposition to delta metrin. Um, uh, alone or in combination. And clearly what we found globally is when the mutations are alone, 
actually they reduce the susceptibility of the sodium channel, the receptor to the insecticide, but which is not really important. It can be 20, 30 percent reduction. While when you combine the mutation together, then you can, uh, you can, you need to increase by 100-fold or more, up to 1,000-fold the insecticide concentration to start to impact on the susceptibility of the sodium channel. So meaning that when you start having a, a combination of KDR mutation together, you are not uh, making an addition of resistance. It's probably a synergy of resistance, with, with, which is also becoming a, a problem. Just also to report that for a long time, we didn't find any KDR mutation in Albopictus was really rare uh, to, to detect, and, that's, and this is, has been really quite recent, probably because of the expansion of Albopictus in many places, and probably because Aedes Albopictus has been exposed to more insecticide by colonizing more the urban area and, and spreading uh, worldwide. So now what we know, we have found two um, mutations in V1016 and F34, like Aedes aegypti, a mutation that has been found in Singapore, China, Brazil, China, uh, uh, for this kind of mutation. And this one, the V1016G, is present in Asia and now in Europe. Okay, and this is also a worry for, for, the, for, for, for that. There is one um, mutation that has been detected and reported, but the role in resistance to me uh, is not so clear. So, same, when you compare the resistance level to parathroids we, between Aedes aegypti and Allopictus, uh, and you see the resistance ratio that, we have, that has been reported in different studies, clearly the resistance of Aedes aegypti for a long time has been much higher than Allopictus. This is some data that has a bit old now, 2018. So, uh, but you can see that the problem clearly about re of our resistance is mainly Aedes aegypti. Uh, because the fold of resistance were uh, reported in publication was much more higher than what we, we find for albo albopictus. However, this is changing, uh, as I say, because the resistance to albopictus is, is increasing in the recent year really quickly, uh, both in terms of fre frequency and prevalence and, insect and resistance level. If we uh, just have a look at what's going on in Brazil, and this is the, some of the work of the, our good colleague here, Ademir, this is present, that has, I probably uh, work extensively on the KDR mutation in, in the country. Uh, what did they have found? There's three main KDR mutations present in Brazil, eh? uh, the 4410, the 1016, and 1534, really key mutation playing a role in resistance. And actually, uh, they are the combination of the genotypes. Uh, in Brazil, okay? And actually there's eight KDR genotypes in Brazil that, are, uh, that can be associated. And clearly, but they have found that mainly 80% of all the genotypes they found are clearly belonging to a one R2 type of genotype. That means it's a combination of genotypes that are found more frequently than the other, okay? And they could develop uh, really good uh, work about the distribution and frequency of these different mutation, especially here you can see the map, S is the susceptible allele in blue, uh, yellow is the R1 kind haplotype here with one single mutation, and the red color is the presence of this R2 haplotype, which is the most uh, dangerous one because it's the one conferring the highest resistance, and you can see that in Brazil, resistance is everywhere, high and, high, uh, and widely distributed. But however, what they show also is that the, there is not a uniformity of the, resi of the KDR resistance. It's everywhere, but it's not like uniform everywhere. And they, by using some different KDR index and things, they could see that the genetic structuration, especially relating to KDR, is not the same everywhere. And they have been identified different type of, not cluster, but different zone in Brazil where the resistance based on KDR index is different. Okay, that means that it's not exactly all the same genotype, all the same haplotype that we have in all regions. And they have been working recently specifically in Amapa region because it's really particular for uh, a region that is not really distant from each other. There is a strong genetic structuration in Amapa states uh, among Aedes aegypti, okay, from uh, south to north transects uh, along this road. Uh, that has really different cluster, clustering effect and genetic structure, and with a population in the north of Oyapok that has, uh, of course, strong R2, R2 resistance, but now are also new, new genotypes coming, and this population is particularly 
uh, resistance to insecticide. So in a small area, there is also a strong uh, diversity and uh, probably due to the impact of treatments, uh, insecticide, but probably also some environmental determinant that may explain this kind of, of difference in only 500 kilometers from, from, from here. Just to also highlight that I guess resistance is spreading uh, also in Europe, which is quite new. Uh, and actually, you can see here the distribution of the V1016G. Uh, uh, the substitution, KDR uh, in Aedes albopictus in Europe. So now the KDR has been reported in at least nine countries. So the first report di date from just 2016 and 17 in Italy. So you can imagine that in a couple, just a couple of years, then is now present in at least nine countries. And actually it has been found that there is two distinct genetic clusters also. Uh, they have identified a Western cluster an eastern cluster that may reflect different events of mutation, different introduction of mutation uh, also in Europe. And actually, we also have been working in Europe to uh, develop uh, bioseed resistance uh, reports that has been published, uh, I think, this year. And also, they are reporting increasing number of mosquito population resistance to insecticide, of course, uh, the Aedes AGP and the Albopictus. Well, Albopictus is essentially present in Europe, but we have Aedes AGP that's coming to arrive in Europe. It's present in Madeira Island, it's present in Georgia, Turkey, and it has been recently introduced in, uh, in Cyprus. So uh, even Aedes AGP is spreading, is increasing in this distribution. So you can see that the, this problem of resistance is, is everywhere. Just now, <laughs> sorry. Just now, uh, just a, a word about what we know about the P450s, the metabolic resistance, especially P450s is a big family, eh? more than 400 genes that's, that's play an important role in the detoxification of paratroid, but not only, to all insecticides that we can use in public health. You can see that there have been found different type of marker, eh? of a, a genetic marker has been published for Aedes aegypti, Albopictus, Gambia in Africa, Arabiensis, Anopheles funestus, Anopheles minimus in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And here there's not too many reports, but because probably it's date from 2020, uh, since two years time or three years time, there has been increasing report also of metabolic resistance marker in uh, uh, Anopheles albimanus in, in the region. So this family is mainly studied for because uh, they can detoxify a lot of insecticide classes. There is evidence for detoxification of paratroids, carbamate, DDT, neonicotine, and even IGR, especially piripoxifen. Just a word to finish on re metabolic resistance. Uh, actually, it has been uh, challenging to study metabolic resistance compared to target site mo modification uh, because, it, yeah, it's, it's really difficult to track in, in, in the field. Uh, it's a complex system. Huh? It's, we are not targeting one gene. Huh? It's, as I told you, it's, a, it's a multiple uh, genes, so it's not easy when you have to deal with uh, more than 100 genes, which one are playing a role. Uh, we have some synergies biochemical assay that has been developed also uh, a long time ago, but it's not really specific. We have still few really uh, relevant molecular markers validated, uh, and they are mainly based on RNA markers, and uh, RNA marker has more difficult to, to, to study compared to DNA marker, uh, especially uh, also to keep them, to preserve them, to collect them. Uh, study on metabolic resistance is also costly. Eh? We now need to go to really DNA, RNA-seq, uh, and, and LGS technology. That's no, not every lab can do that. High skill needs some good knowledge on genomics, but also on bioinformatics. So all these kind of things that explain also uh, why it has been le a bit less, uh, a bit less studied. Uh, and uh, recently, it has been also observed really cross, uh, cross impact of vector control, different intervention. Uh, environment, pollutant, agro agrochemicals, and the expression of the, the detoxification system. Uh, I think something important to also understand, to have a world picture, is the environmental impacts uh, that can also affect insecticide resistance. Of course, we all know insecticide use for vector control, and especially agriculture, uh, are known to impact on 
the metabolic resistance, especially on detoxification gene, or of course on selection of KDR, but since there is a various kind of insecticide that can be used, clearly the detoxification process, the metabolic process, is targeted and, and is under strong selection by this kind of insecticide. But it has been published that not only uh, natural xenobiotics, especially released by plants, what we call the allochemicals, uh, terpenes, alkaloids, have shown also to impact on the detoxification system of the insects, especially agriculture pests, but, we, but probably in mosquitoes, for example, if for, during a sugar, uh, su uh, sugar uh, um, uh, fed. Um, we also have more evidence about the impact of domestic and household insecticide use, urbanization, pollutants, and we have seen also some publications mm -hmm. have shown that some Anopheles mosquito can now breed in really polluted uh, breeding sites. Uh, that was not observed by the past, and we probably because they express some some uh, resist some detoxification that can that can help them to resist to this, uh, to this um, insecticide effect. And I talk uh, a bit later about that, the microbiome and different uh, studies have shown that the mosquito have, uh, have some bacteria that can detoxify insecticide. Um, so this is all potential source of selection of, of resistance. I want just to come back on this impact of pollutant because we always think that it's insecti public health insecticide that contribute to resistance was probably the impact of agriculture use and uh, different pollutants are, are and will be inc an increasing problem in the world. Here you can see the recent publication in 2020 of the global pesticide market uh, in the world and clearly is, is growing. Uh, there's no reduction of pesticide, maybe except maybe a bit in Europe because of the regulation and strong regulation that's on the Green Deal that wants to reduce this insecticide use. But clearly you can see that the amounts per year in ton of, uh, of agriculture insecticide is, is, is huge. And is the highest in, in, in South America. We say more than 700,000 ton of insecticide use per year. Uh, and this has been uh, doubled in, in 20 years time. Okay, so of course this has strong implication for environments, for the public health, but also for our mosquitoes that are breeding probably in some sites really close to, uh, to the agriculture things. And we know historically that the resistance, especially parietal resistance and KDR mutation has been historically found higher in area of of where insecticide use for agricultural purpose, especially for cotton pest area was really high. And the first work has been done really a long time ago, but where we have seen at the beginning of the resistance that the, the frequency of the KDR resistance was stronger and, uh, in the area where there was a cotton, um, cotton uh, uh, culture. Okay, and just to give you an example, one year of use of insecticide in Côte d'Ivoire, for example, represent 10 years of use of insecticide for the Oncocercos control program that has been implemented in West Africa. So we are dealing with completely different category of insecticide use. Something interesting that has been published also recently is the impact of the exposure of the mosquito to agrochemical mixture, that means what they use in the field for the agriculture and, and protection, on the mosquitoes especially on the detoxification and the, re the resistance to uh, insecticide use in public health at both larval and adult stage. So when they pre-expose, for example, mosquito, larvae, or non-expose, huh? here you have, have the, the, the non-expose is, is white and expose is, is, uh, is black and non-expose is, um, is in white. When they pre-expose uh, mosquito larvae to uh, this chemical, uh, agrochemical mixture, they clearly the mosquitoes are much more resistant, well, much more, a threefold, which is some significance, a threefold lower mortality here to some insecticide, especially for clotianidine and here Fludora fusion that combine both clotianidine and deltametrine. So exposing, pre-exposing mosquitoes to an agriculture mixture will, increase, uh, will decrease their mortality to public health insecticide and public health formulation, which is a formulation de deployed in... Uh, 
in, uh, in, in pubic hair. And uh, these, these guys have seen that when these mosquitoes that survive more than the non-exposed mosquitoes express some uh, detoxification gene, cuticular gene, sequestration gene involved in the sequestration of insecticide compared to the non-exposed mosquito. So the link between this use of mixture and uh, detoxification gene that, that are involved in detoxification of pubic health insecticide is clear. And uh, the same, in the same way, here is agrochemical mixture, here is pollutants. For example, they have tested in the pre-exposure of mosquitoes to fungicides, to EV metals. And seen what's going on in terms of detoxification process of mosquitoes, they have seen that when you pre pre-expose mosquito to different pollutants, they will over-express some detoxification gene that play a role in the resistance to public health insecticide. So just to illustrate this, I think this, this part of the work that is really important for the future, environmental impact also on the, on the mosquitoes and, uh, uh, and the resistance, okay? Now going a bit more to, to the operational impacts, what do we know? because we talk about resistance, monitoring resistance, but what do we know? Actually, very few examples of epidemiological evidence that resistance can uh, really impact the control of uh, diseases. Uh, I think probably uh, one of the most famous one, is an old one, but is, is clearly famous, is what's happened in South Africa um, with the use of DDT and replacement by parathroids. In South Africa, they used to control malaria by IRS uh, in this region where Anopheles uh, fu uh, funestusia is the main vector. And for historically, since the 60s, they used to have the DDT for malaria control, and malaria was mainly uh, under control using DDT. In 90s, they changed. They switched here to the use of introduction of paratroid in 1996. What's going on? Really, uh, strongly after the introduction of Peritre, there have been an increased number of cases that has been then it has been clearly a failure of Peritre indoor residual spraying. They revert back to DDT in 2000, and the cases has been back to 91% reduction of malaria cases. Okay, so clearly this is probably one of the clear examples about the impact of resistance. And after, of course, they, they have checked that the mosquito in this area were resistant to uh, the paratroids. What do we know about the arboviruses? But even less. Uh, there is clearly, to me, my knowledge, no really evidence for an epidemiological impact of, of resistance. But of course, we uh, suspect there is a relationship between resistance, vector control failure, and outbreaks is, is likely. But probably we need more investigation. We don't have a, a very good data for that. The only thing that is a bit surprising for me, and that's, uh, that's the raised question, is when we look at, for example, the Zika-related microcephaly incidents in 2016 in Brazil, the places where we had the highest microcephaly cases were also in, in places where TB4 resistance is known to be very high. So what's going on? It's not clearly a correlation, but it's surprising. Say, what, what's going on? Do we have an impact of the resistance on the control because of the intervention? Uh, uh, second example is a chikungunya related incidence in Italy also. We had, uh, in Italy in 2007 and 2017, <laughs> a micro epidemics of chikungunya with more than 200 cases and 500 cases here. And where, where we had these outbreaks is also area where the muta Kaidia mutation was the highest in, in the country. So how to interpret this data is complicated. Do we have more treatment, more cases, so we treat more, and so we make a selection pressure on mosquito? Or do we have resistance in mosquito and some, uh, and some problem of control? We cannot respond, eh? but it's just to highlight that we need more data and evidence about this impact of resistance. What we are sure and what we know is that resistance has uh, an entomological impact. I mean, when we have resistance, uh, we have problem to control, kill, or reduce the population of mosquito. One of the first examples, the impact of insecticide resistance on space spraying has been done uh, in Martinique Island by our group by using uh, uh, what we call the WHO cage by USA, eh, is to expose mosquitoes at different distance to a track uh, here that is spraying the insecticide. And we record the mortality of uh, a reference population, a susceptible po population, and a, a resistance population. For example, in this area, mosquitoes are 
really strongly resistant to bytrail, and we spray and record the knockdown mortality of the mosquito after a period of time. What's going on, for example, that when we use a Bora strain, Bora is the really international susceptible colony eh, that is used in many labs, which is susceptible to insecticide. When we use the Bora strain and we spray insecticide, we have very strong effects of all insecticide testing, an organophosphate in red, and uh, the, the pyrethrin based or pyrethroid based insecticide are very good knockdown effect after 20 minutes. When we look at mortality after 24 hours, good efficacy of the organophosphate and delta metrin based formulation. A bit less with new formulation is, is a pyrethrin based formulation that has been tested that show a bit less efficacy. But globally, up to 1,600 meters of the source of treatment, you kill your mosquito. Clearly, when you now use the local population, clearly different trends, except the organophosphates, malathion here, that, that was effective to control the, the mosquito. All the other insecticides can, do not have an impact of knockdown or mortality of mosquito up to 10 meters. You don't kill them, uh, clearly, compared to the susceptible one. Okay? So clearly, there is really big difference uh, between the, the, these two. And we made a phase three trial, that means in three different locations using same as space spray, operational dosage according to WHO treatments, three rounds of spray treatments in villages using delta metrin treatment because we cannot use OP in France, unfortunately, for space spray. So we, we are very limited in terms of insecticide. And when we do the treatment, we observe quite more or less the same as in simulated field condition. When you look at the mortality rate in sentinel cage of mosquito and susceptible and resistance, there is difference. Is the treatment is not optimum in terms of mortality and susceptible population, uh, probably because of uh, the field condition. Uh, you don't reach all the, the mosquitoes. But when you look at the resistance one, whatever the treatment inside, outside the house, you don't kill anything with your treatment. And this has been co was confirmed by a trapping system eh, to, to trap the field mosquito population after, before, and after three rounds of treatment outside, inside the house by putting BG traps. You do, uh, before or after the treatment, the density of mosquito is not changing at all. Okay? So that was really some uh, evidence that uh, space spray um, in area of resistance has really, probably has low impact on, on, on the control of, of disease if they don't have any impact on the mosquitoes around. Uh, what we know about the impact of insecticide resistance on indoor residual spraying. Really good work that has been done by our colleague from Mexico. Uh, where they have been testing uh, IRS products, uh, Bendiocarb, uh, Delta Metrine versus control, and Bendiocarb. Uh, so they have been working, uh, they have done a randomized control trial in three localities of Merida, 42 blocks. Uh, they are based on the, on the baseline data, they have m selected some cluster here to allocate some treatments. And they have measured the abundance of mosquito female, like SGP female, before and after treatments. And here the same, what globally what has been observed, you can see here the abundance of mosquito female, and total Aedes aegypti, and total blood-fed female that has been observed before and after three months of treatment. The black is the control, the red is the pyrethroid treatments, and the green here, uh, the, the, yeah, the green is the bendiocarb, the carbamates. And clearly, over time, there is no reduction at all of, of mosquito based on delta metrin. And they clearly attribute a delta metrin treatment failure because this population are highly resistant to paratroid. Only the bendiocarb spray could reduce the ADCGP abandoned by 60% over a six month, uh, three months period. So here again, these mosquito, they have been tested the mosquito, strongly resistant to paratroid, IRS treatments as low impacts. Last example is with mosquito nets in Africa. We have been testing in experimental huts design here, which is a WHO uh, standardized methodology for testing, evaluating insecticide product in phase two. That means before going in the field, we test all the LLIN and IRS products in experimental huts to measure mortality of the mosquitoes, brood feeding rate, exophily, deterrency. And uh, when we collect the data from different experimental earth trial um, in susceptible area, we can see that the mortality of the mosquito, susceptible mosquito, we have uh, Malanvin in Benin, the places where mosquito were susceptible, so we could make trial with susceptible population. When we look at the efficacy of permanent two, permanent three, 
really good uh, mortality rate of the mosquito uh, in susceptible area. When we now look at the mortality rate for different population in Africa having different kind of resistance mechanism, you can see the difference. Yeah? And of course, uh, in most of cases, we can see that the lower mortality rate of the mosquito where when there is a combination, of course, of mechanism, KDR plus P450s here, that you really have problem to, 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 to kill them, okay? So just, I think, I'll give an overview about how resistance can impact on different uh, treatment. <coughs> it's not an exhaustive list. There are plenty examples of the impact of resistance that, that show to reduce the personal protection of long-lasting nets, reduce the duration or efficacy of larval treatment, reduce the efficacy of pyrotrous space spray, in different, also in French Guiana, but also in Southeast Asia, shorten the duration of the IRS product, and even uh, reduce the efficacy of household products that can be used by people, but also uh, space spray in, um, in airplane. So this is really what we know. Uh, in the recent years, so I arrive a bit to the wind network, what we have, probably a bit long, I don't know how long I have, Ademir. Uh, so why we have established this network, so in 2016, uh, with WHO uh, support, we have uh, decided to develop a, a network, international networks, to better understand, track, improve the surveillance of the resistance in Aedes mosquitoes, especially. Uh, why Aedes mosquito? Because uh, there are not too many teams in the world that really structure and works together on, on IDS mosquito compared to malaria vector. So we have been involved uh, uh, 19 institutions over the world, including, of course, the Fieu Cruz that joined us at the beginning of the story. And the network objective was to establish a global resistance surveillance network of arborist vectors, fill knowledge gaps, identify research priority on insecticide resistance, and assess WHO and uh, countries in decision making for vector control. That has been the key key action. And um, over this network, uh, since 2016, we have made different kind of work, just to give you an example. First, to structure the first network on IDS, publish some uh, review and publication to fill knowledge gaps on resistance and resistance management, centralized, uh, establish the first centralized database for IDS mosquitoes, uh, produce technical reports to help in uh, decision making, uh, reports, guidance, SOPs, for example, for helping labs to make some good monitoring system. Organize uh, international conference. The first one was in Rio and Singapore. After that, we could not organize any conference. Uh, the COVID came and, and we would like to now uh, reactivate this conference uh, and workshop, training workshop for, for countries or lab willing to, to implement uh, um, resistance. Uh, how long I, uh, where is Ademir now? How long? I, I can continue a bit or five? Okay, just to let me know. Huh? Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, so just I will go quickly about just few achievements that has been made because you have been a good overview about resistance. What WIN has been contributed to is first to establish the first map uh, to better understand, before that we didn't know, to be honest, where is the resistance. So we have made a good systematic review to try to better track where is resistance in the world, but also at regional scale, in order that we better understand the, the resistance, better understand the distribution of metabolic resistance and KDR mutation, where we have, what kind of markers we have to track in different regions, for example. Do the, the KDR mutation are in really localized or are universal mutation found everywhere? and establish this central database that has been, um, that has been used by countries uh, to better understand the, the situation. We have been also developing some guidance for insecticide resistance management, for example, the making a pro and cons of the techniques uh, that has been used for tracking insecticide resistance from bureau essay to molecular methods, advantage drawbacks of the techniques, and uh, for the first time we also try to address this that has not been really um, develop more, and I think we do, is a better framework for implementation of IRM in countries, what to do. Uh, and we actually propose a plan based on two actions that should be complementary, is not only to implement a good resistance monitoring system and to stratify the risk of resistance according to the level that you face in the population, and this is the first step, you monitor resistance and according to the level of resistance, you classify the level of the risk in order to modify action. Um, it's also to have a two-step process of monitoring and evaluation of treatment efficacy because just monitoring resistance is not enough. 
what's, what's, when you detect resistance, wha what to do with that. It's also good in parallel to have some evaluation of treatment to see if the, the treatment is working, yes, perfect. If the treatment is not working, do I, I, what, where is the coming the problem? From resistance, from operational failure, uh, bad use of insecticide, bad application, or if it's coming from a resistance. So this is a process that has been proposed for this two-step approach, testing and evaluation and monitoring system. One uh, more review that has been done is an to propose an integrated IDES management uh, strategy, which we call AAM, which proposes actually a portfolio of actions uh, to do that are tailored to the different epidemiological and entomological risk scenario. That means uh, we don't think that uh, we can apply the same things in area where the mosquito is recently introduced, like in some places in Europe, when it's uh, est introduced and uh, established, when the mosquito are established with some epidemics, or when the transmission is endemic, for example. Because it's not the same, exactly the same problem, and, uh, and, um, and we need to adapt to graduate the action according also to the risk. Uh, so what has been done, it's an evidence-based review, uh, including more than 20 meta-analyses and systematic review, to try to classify the strengths of evidence we have with vector control intervention from entomological data up to the best one, the epidemiological data. And actually, this, this kind of, uh, of uh, pyramid uh, to strengthen, to, find, to classify the strengths of evidence exists already. Eh? but only with epidemiological evidence with based on RCT or observational studies. And we propose to add also the evidence of entomological evidence based on RCT as well for entomology and evidence or optional observ observational studies. So we classify in order that we could propose according to the risk from low to high. Well, we don't see a eh, different kind of surveillance action to do in terms of resistance, collection, monitoring, mapping. We'll not go in details. Huh? If you want, the review is there. For vector control as well, what to do in terms of using of insecticides, space spraying, application, repellent things, uh, and also different kind of, of supporting and enabling mechanism that can be done in terms of social mobilization, advocacy, uh, and things. So this is a plan that has been based on the GVCR, uh, and, uh, but with more technical guidance to countries willing to implement that. And the last one I think we'll finish that has been to discuss also the resistance breaking tool. So the potential of alternative tools that we have now in the pipe uh, to better uh, control or to play a role as part of integrated vector management in terms of resistance things. As you can see, there's new techniques coming in, new or old, old techniques coming back. Uh, there is the use of new and pat entomogenic uh, pathogen auto dissemination techniques, sterile insecticide technique, riddle, genetics-based control, attractive toxic sugar baits, and you can see the different kind of new tools, Volbachia, spatial repellent, auto dissemination techniques, use of traps, can be used to target the different mosquito, of a different step of the life cycle of the, of the mosquitoes. And us, what we have trying to do is to say, to assess the anticipated impact that the intervention can have based on their mode of action. And for example, the first one we can use are insecticides still, because it's still what we have in hand. New insecticides coming, insecticide treated material, you may know that uh, compared to the past, we have now in increasing uh, uh, product using different kind of insecticide in mixture. For example, we have long lasting nets that we can combine, paratroid, but other insecticide classes like chlorphenapyr, uh, piriproxifen, that, that was forbidden a, a couple of years ago. That means it was only based on paratroid. And now these kind of new tools using different insecticides can have a potential also to, uh, to be used against the, 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 the resistance population. Uh, there is also new formulation with IRS that are promising with new mode of action, new insecticides for space spraying, if tubes that are used in Africa and show really good impact on, on malaria uh, preventions uh, still use pyrethroid, deltamethrin, but now they also try to combine different insecticide, uh, different mode of action with the electrostatic nettings that can also have some potential. Okay, so in terms of insecticide base, we never have so many new tools, we can say, that we can use.
Of course, there is now interesting system attracting toxic sugar bait that we can try to pull to kill the mosquito. We have some attractants that we can use on this station. And when the mosquito is coming, boom, is, is, there's an insecticide that can kill him. That's also offer a, a possibility to use different kind of insecticide. And there's been some recent study using RNA interference-based insecticides to, come to mix with these kind of things. That is interesting because really specific. Uh, the fungus has been tested. The fungus also has completely different mode of action than the insecticides. Uh, they kill at slow, slow, slow acting compounds, but that may also be interesting for as part of resistance management. Riddle, the Oxitec mosquitoes, that has been also used in Brazil, eh, you know, that there's a modified genes, uh, it's a suppression, uh, let, uh, lethal dominant suppression gene that's when you, you mix a male with female of the field, the, the generation, the next generation will die, will not be able to survive uh, in absence of tetracycline uh, in laboratory. And this has been also, for us, eh, represent interesting tools because of deploying this mosquito, you, re you may reduce the insecticide use. Sterile insecticide technique, you probably know that it has a lot of ongoing trials in the world, in South America, in Europe, in, to test the SIT and show to really uh, a good impact on, on the population reduction. This trial show more than 80% reduction, and I think it has been eliminated, uh, the CGP has been eliminated, eliminated in Cuba after a SIT a release, so it's, uh, it's uh, really interesting for both control but also for resistance. And actually we have a problem is now with this Wolbachia. Uh, Wolbachia release because you know that releasing Wolbachia, um, you need to introgress the local population to release your, your, your mosquito having Wolbachia because if not they will die in the field because they will not survive if they are susceptible. So uh, they release insecticide resistance mosquito in the field. And we don't really know uh, how it works. I mean, how to release these mosquitoes, what kind of resistance can be released. There is no actu uh, currently guidance, no guidance. So that means uh, to, to how to release these mosquitoes. So this is something that um, needs to be investigated, especially in Brazil, huh, because you know that a lot of World Bank here mosquito will be released in, in the future. Uh, so I think uh, just to finish on that, the win has contributed to different kind of work, conference organization, but more recently that can be useful for, for people is to know that there has been a way some win partner has contributed and support WHO in the establishment of new methodology, a new bottle bioassay to a test insecticide, new class of insecticide that can be used, uh, production of reports to provide diagnostic concentration. We have more than 30 new discriminating doses that can be used to monitor Anopheles and Aedes mosquito, which is a good, good thing also. And uh, that has been done also for sunflies. That means we have now monitor those to use for monitoring the resistance in, sun, in sunflies. Uh, and also a couple of new SOPs that people can use, labs, eh? labs or countries can use to uh, assess the resistance to, to different insecticides. Uh, just, uh, I think I arrived in the last slides. Uh, we are here also today uh, with our colleagues from South, uh, from South America because we are trying to see if we can expand what has been done by WIN at international level to develop uh, more South American research networks that can be useful to fill knowledge gaps, identify research priority, and provide technical and scientific supports uh, to countries and, and power to respond to, to increasing threat of resistance. There is key partner that that so far are discussing and involved in these projects. Uh, but actually, we are organizing these days a meeting with all uh, nine countries from, from, from the regions to try to set up these networks and then to uh, include more partners in the regions once we will have this uh, regional network in place. So this is something interesting for future works on resistance in the regions. Uh, I will finish this uh, on, uh, on this. What can be done also because we are in the prospects. Just to let you know that we published recently uh, an integrated plan of insecticide resistance surveillance uh, in France. Why I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that? Because it's probably one of the first one that has been used to, to really try to guide decision making based on the uh, use of the insecticide resistance data. Normally, it's, uh, it's complicated to use the data for countries, what to do with the data. Uh, you have resistance, no resistance, moderate resistance, but how we use this data to change the vector control policy. 
so we have published two things. We have uh, made a publication, but also a report for France, uh, the France Minist Minist Ministry of uh, Health and Environment. Uh, and this plan, actually, bon, has two things. It provides first the methodology uh, uh, for collection. I mean, also, and the proportion in a, co in a territory that show this resistance from isolated site, multiple site, or majority of site, we try to classify a risk. And based on this risk, we propose different action of monitoring and vector control things. And for France, for example, we could, for different insecticide and species, uh, classify a resistance uh, here for different species and insects. Some are here, really high risk, that means for this species, we we should stop the use of insecticide, for example, delta metrin, because we know that it will select and will have no impact on uh, probably on mosquito po population, while other territory of France have different levels. So it's help us to adjust also uh, the, the, the situation, adjust the vector control intervention. Uh, last slide is to uh, inform you that we also uh, this year uh, get a project, an EU project that is called INNOVEC, which is aiming to make a research and innovation partnership for enhancing the surveillance and control of mosquito vector of emerging diseases. This is an, uh, really you know, 12 countries are in, involved, 21 institutions, including Brazil, UNESCO in Sao Paulo and Fiocruz. And this is really to promote uh, cross-sectoral, multidisciplinary and international collaboration stand to standardize, optimize and promote innovative approach, technology for IDS control and especially stimulated exchange, you can see, between Europe, Brazil, Africa uh, in terms of, uh, of knowledge, transfer of knowledge and technology. And just for Brazil here, because um, just the part what we do in Brazil, this project aims, of course, to strengthen the scientific ex exchange between France, uh, Europe, not only France, and Brazil, contribute to teaching program, supervise students, postdoc, but also to test and uh, evaluate new tools and technology. For example, we here we, we have planned to work more with RNA-based biopesticides. We are also working with new nanotechnology for encapsulate repellent and insecticide with UNESP and testing new mass trapping technology with industry, biogens, and uh, with, uh, with the academics. So it's really to mix academic and private people to, to develop and optimize tools and show prom promote and transfer knowledge of technology and uh, organize also workshop. And we have uh, one first workshop that will be organized with your crews, PAO, probably in July on insecticide resistance techniques and methodology. Okay, so I want uh, just here to think we can keep it for discussion. Maybe it's a take-home message that I've been, uh, I have been, um, I have been uh, summarized. I think, but we can. I don't know if you want. Since we have a discussion session, we can let in and coming back to gaps and, and things uh, to save time a bit because I'm, I, I was a bit long. Thank you so much and, and sorry for the for the time. Vansan, muito obrigado. É, obrigado falar o inglês tranquilo. Acho que todo mundo entendeu, não foi? É, nós é, temos tempo ainda para perguntas e discussões. Estou vendo que agora estão aparecendo alguma aqui, algumas aqui no chat. Nós vamos falar. É, também, quem quiser fazer pergunta aqui no auditório, por favor, levanta a mão. Pode perguntar em português. É, pode, eu acho que seria bom tentar falar um pouquinho de inglês também. Vocês podem tentar. Beth? Rosan, parabéns pela sua apresentação. Ah, então sei. Então tá bom. Parabéns mais uma vez. É muito interessante, eu já vim acompanhando é, um pouco desse trabalho. Nós temos uma parceria com, com a Ademir. É, e quando eu vi aquele mapa do Brasil com tantos pontinhos de populações resistentes, de mosquitos resistentes a inseticidas, é, nós já estamos discutindo, eu e a Demir, é, nós precisamos ver isso com o vetor da leishmaniose visceral, Lutzomia longipalpis. Ele está espalhado por todo o Brasil. E alguns estados relatam para o Ministério da Saúde que o o uso do inseticida não está funcionando. Então, como eu sou consultora do Ministério da Saúde, eu fui pessoalmente a alguns estados verificar 
que podia ser a validade do produto, podia ser o equipamento que não estivesse funcionando bem, ou o técnico que não estivesse sabendo aplicar. Mas, de fato, eu constatei que não era isso. Que eles estavam fazendo certo, que eles estavam usando o produto dentro da validade, o equipamento estava funcionando bem. Então, nós já começamos a falar sobre isso dentro do Ministério da Saúde. A gente precisa fazer um trabalho desse. E, e eu e a Ademir, nós estamos discutindo muito como é que nós vamos é, montar o projeto. A gente espera contar com a sua colaboração, que é o que você está aqui, está no meu laboratório. Então, é, eu acho que é, a gente tem que fazer isso. Esse trabalho que você mostrou é, é bastante interessante e chama atenção para a gente, porque a leishmaniose visceral, a gente tem que trabalhar com a vigilância, principalmente, para evitar que haja uma evolução de pacientes para o óbito. Então, nós vamos continuar trabalhando nessa ideia juntos. Ok? Tudo bem? Sim, sim, sim. obrigado. Não, não, eu, eu entendi. Eu, eu acho que... que Uh, I can respond claro, in English, English claro. uh, because it's more. Uh, no, I, I agree that uh, we were discussing that with Ademir. We miss information with uh, other species than mosquitoes. Uh, actually, also, what maybe one one thing is that before this last report and this new report on, on phlebotoma, how to address resistance, there has been no really standardized methodology discriminating concentration. So people use different doses, different things. In, around the world, India, different than Pakistan, than, than here in Latin America. So now, first, this, the fact that we have methodology, more standardized things for phlebotome, I think, help. And we should uh, think about that to now also in monitoring, include the sunflies. Huh? Uh, I think it will be really nice. We were talking, no, it's tomorrow, it's this afternoon, sorry. Uh, we also tried, we need to discuss as part of the wind network what to do, the range, and especially the targeted species. At the beginning, well, the wind is Aedes mosquito. We probably uh, wish the group uh, wants to extend to mosquitoes, which is not only Aedes, but we will have a discussion to see if we stay just on mosquitoes or if we also want to uh, bring St. Flies as part of the network collaboration. It's discussion. Huh? Uh, I'm not deciding myself for uh, what will be uh, the, the, the target species that we should focus in, in, in South America. Because, uh, and I, I, this is something to, to discuss. But definitely, more research, monitoring on sunflies is priority. I don't know how to do uh, in terms of funding uh, with Ministry of Health, if they, they will be uh, interesting to contribute, participate, for example, to also funding. I don't know. But, Because less funding, eh, probably for for leishmaniasis and for phlebotome than for other diseases, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I think in, in interesting, important. I agree. Eh? Uh, ah, sim. <laughs> Muito obrigado. Eh? Bom, obrigado, Beth. Obrigado, Vansan. É, temos aqui. Ó, quem mais aqui no auditório quer fazer alguma pergunta? Aline. Aline. Inglês ou português, Aline? Não, não. Tenta em inglês, Aline. Vamos lá. Tenta em inglês. Let's try it. <laughs> uh, we know there are lots of studies uh, in cytide resistance in Adzigitai, but when you talk about malaria vectors, as you showed us a map, there are nothing. Maybe it's un unreported, but the question is, Why, if uh, we are looking for the wrong target? Maybe we spend a long time looking for KDR mutations in Anopheles Darlinge here in Brazil, and there's no mutation, so we are frustrated. <laughs> But now uh, I have to ask you if you have something to tell about uh, metabolic resistance or where else? I don't know, something mm. to tell about it. Obrigado, uh, um, Aline. Uh, oh, first of all, for Anopheles, as you say, Anopheles mosquito, there is two, I think, both. Under-reporting things, we were discussing with our colleague 
from the regions. Uh, well, they, are, they actually, what we've seen on the map is just what is also reporting on database, is not meaning that it's all the publication and all the work that has been done. Yesterday, we have really nice presentation from colleagues from all countries, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, French Guiana, uh, Peru, and they have much more data also that they have that probably is not existing. So, but one thing to do when we were discussing, first to update the data, making why not a review to update this information, because probably we, we have more things than what we WHO is, is showing or others. Um, now, KDR, uh, less resistance in anopheles in, uh, in, in South America is clear. Less resistance compared, the problem is probably less than Africa, for sure, but it's coming. Albimanus uh, has everything. Eh? Albimanus is resistance to pyridroids, KDR mutation, ACE1 mutation, so, and metabolic markers has been found recently. So, albimanus is probably becoming the, like an Anopheles Gambier mosquito, uh, probably in, in the future. Darling D is different. It's true, it's less probably less exposed, probably, eh? less exposed to insecticide than the other because no KDR, few resistance in terms of resistance. Do we, we don't know if it's under, under investigated, probably. I mean, we probably should better uh, improve our monitoring of Darling G, probably, yeah? because when we start looking at it, we find uh, there's some report of resistance. Um, and consider metabolic resistance, yes, for sure. Uh, we have been, uh, it's true that we have been focusing on KDR for a long time, uh, which is really, really uh, well known, I think, in Brazil, uh, especially, and, uh, and uh, metabolic resistance is probably, to me, we always say it's always KDR mutation and target site that is the main problem. I'm not sure. I do think in future, or what we found in other countries or Africa, metabolic resistance can be uh, probably a, a more problematic things. First, because of the number of, of genes potentially involved, uh, uh, detoxification to many compounds, not only to, not like cross resistance like KDR, DDT, and pyrethroid. Yeah, uh, some genes can detoxify different class more class than, than just two class. Uh, so the level of expression amplification of these genes can be very high. We have more evidence on Culex, but in Culex, they have seen in Culex cancrefaciatus in Europe, for example, in France, that the number of, of gene amplification is huge, can be uh, sometimes 15, 30 amplification, and of course, uh, providing really high level of resistance. So this is something that is missing probably a bit. Yeah, in Brazil and in the region. I think, Ademir, you can say a word on that, so probably you're, you're working more on that. Uh, there are also exchanges with, with United States on, on that, and France, to better investigate this metabolic marker uh, in, in the future. I think it's really needed. Ademir, maybe you know, also... Yeah, yeah, I think you address everything. And especially if Anopheles Darling, because we, we generally look to KDR because, you know, more than 14 species of Anopheles have the same KDR mutation. So we were expecting that we could find the same in Anopheles Darling, but we have plenty of evidences also from our colleagues from other parts of South America that KDR seems not to be the point in Darling, and you have to also look to other markers. Yeah, I think uh, that's it. Bom, temos uh, algumas outras questões ou comentários aqui no, no chat. O Rafi, que é egresso aqui da, da casa, né, da, da biologia parasitária, ele pergunta se, bom, já que temos marcadores moleculares para resistência à piretroide, Qual deveria ser um bom marcador para resistência malation? Hmm, good question. <laughs> we are, no, ah, can you? Uh, thank you, Rafi. Uh, good question. Uh, I, I don't know all kind of studies, and probably I miss some information, but what we have in terms of Temefos resistance is quite good. We have identified in Thailand, in French Guiana, uh, other places, some CCE. Uh, gene uh, markers that really uh, play a role in TMFOS resistance. That's so. That's that's okay. That's clear. In terms of malation, uh, I don't have. I, I don't know. 
to be honest, I don't know if someone knows, maybe in the group or here, uh, specific, uh, good marker. When I say specific, it's an expression of a gene uh, that can detoxify the malatian. I don't know. Um, I remember old studies from Liverpool School that they have found some um, uh, enzyme uh, that is not based on overexpression but was based on change of the conformation of the enzyme. I, I'm, I think it was an anophilus stephensi. That's not an overexpression. Change of the conformation, mutation, and change of the conformation of the enzyme uh, was able to do to have better detoxification of the, the OP, and I think it's malatian. Uh, need to check, but here in this case was a more uh, a SNP, huh? a mutation like a changing conformation, not expression, but need to, 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 to check. Recent, uh, recent data, ADS EGPT, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't have any information. Uh, don't know either. No, <laughs> uh, no. The one million question, um, one million dollar question. Maybe Audrey has uh, some things to contribute, no? Malatian, please. Um, we, oh, okay, sorry. Um, we've done some recent transcriptomic analyses of Aedes aegypti um, that we're getting ready to publish now, and we were able to find some specific P450 oxidases that were associated with malathion resistance in aegypti. We haven't done the functional validation of that yet, but it, it's in line with other transcriptomic data sets that have also shown um, resistance to malathion. So we do think that the P450s might be playing an important role. And then also the ACE1 mutations. Um, we've reported duplication of the ACE1 gene in Anopheles albuminus. Um, and we associated that with phenytrothion resistance, but we suspect that it would also be similar for malathion resistance, but again, we need to, to functionally validate that in the lab. Thank you, Audrey. Very happy to know that. <laughs> yeah, we can include those genes in our panel of markers yeah, for evaluating side resistance very soon, yeah, hopefully. Uh, there is also another question from Hafi. If I understood well, he he's wondering if the um, because he's saying that uh, about the KDR mutation, the 1534 uh, mutation site, we know that has a separate origins, and he sees this. Uh, yeah, in Brazil, there is a uh, different, at, at least two independent origins, right? How is this origin about other mutations, like the 1016, as you saw this mutation in different parts of the world? Again, Ademir, you're, you're the, the experts of KDR mutation in, in Brazil, so probably you have more If you did not study well, well <laughs> our publications. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it has been done for the mutation. Yes, these two events for the 1544 is known huh, from mm -hmm. Caribbean and other uh, Latin uh, South American countries is uh, Venezuela probably is what I, if I may, you know you know you know more Ademir than me for the V ten sixteen E mutation I don't know if there's some work that has been done on that yeah. maybe you if, I, if there's some you probably know me I, I'm not aware about any work on that for this kind of events in Brazil yeah what you have been done so far in associate in collaboration with uh, Professor Jeff Powell from Yale University. And Luciano, his PhD, and Gisela Caconi, all the all the teams, we had the opportunity to evaluate mosquito from several parts of the world, and we genotyped the KGR and we found those uh, mosquitoes with KGR. We looked for some molecular uh, traits that could be associated that we could um, um, hypothesize if they had uh, the same or independent origins. And we found that for the 1534. It seems that we have at least two or three independent origins um, for this mutation. So they probably emerged in different places of the world. In this uh, 1016, we didn't find any evidence of multiple, multiple origins, but just one. So the, the same, the same uh, KDI haplotype with the 1016 mutation found in the US, in Africa, 
in any place in South America, it seems that it has the same origin and spread, and it spread very rapidly. That's what's interesting, because since this, uh, this first recording in South America, it was very fast. All the samples we evaluated from the US were homozygous for this mutation, for example. Yeah. And especially in, in the Amazonia region, this mutation is very abundant and with the same origin in the rest of the world. So uh, we do know for these, uh, for the, uh, for example, the 989 and the 1016G in Asia, but based on the samples we evaluated, it seems that there is only one, uh, a, a single origin. Yep. That's what you have so far, Hafi. Uh, another very interesting question from Daniel. I don't know who is Daniel. Maybe Daniel could uh, introduce himself. No, in the chat. Uh, Daniel ask, is asking if there is uh, an idea of how the loss of diversity affects the mosquitoes borne disease. Uh, how insecticide resistance affects the, uh, the, div the genetic diversity of the mosquitoes. Not sure to understand. Oh, the, the mosquito diversity, genetic diversity, in terms of resistance or in terms of general diversity affects the transmission? Is there an idea on how the loss of diversity is affecting the mosquitoes borne disease? Because uh, if, I, if I understood uh, the sense of his question, he is asking, because the insecticide resistance theoretically promotes the, the loss of diversity. Mm -hmm. And how is it affecting the transmission of vector borne disease? Yeah. If you have any evidence on that. Uh, complicated to, to know all resistance impact. There are some studies that has been done, uh, and they're more on vector competence. Huh? Vector competence studies uh, using susceptible or, or parotid resistance population for, for, for the infection, for example, of, of uh, plasmodium in, in Africa. Uh, and it showed that the, if I remember well, resistance impact first on the infection of mosquitoes. Uh, in terms of prevalence of infection. Uh, we've, uh, I remember, <laughs> higher prevalence of the mosquito having KDR mutation than the, the ones that have no, no mutation. So first, an ID. So when you have a resistant gene, this may impact you, it may impact you, the infectivity of the mosquito uh, to uh, plasmodium, for example. So uh, we need more evidence probably on, on that. Uh, in terms of field, I mean, what's going on in the field? If a population, for example, at population level, having resistance gene may be more uh, competent or maybe have more capacity to transmit is, is unknown to me. Probably it may be increased by the vector capacity. A resistance mosquito may have higher ca vectorial capacity. What if it's resisting and is resisting to a selection pressure, it may survive longer. It's the assumption. Huh? Surviving longer, probably have more times to develop the parasite in, 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 in the mosquito and have more chains to transmit than a mosquito that will not have resistance. But in counterpart, if a resistance gene is impacting the survival of the mosquito, a fitness cost, strong fitness cost, it may a bit compensate, uh, like ACE1 known, ACE1 gene, ACE1G 119S uh, mutation is known to be very costly uh, mutation. It's why we found um, this mutation mainly as a heterozygote or duplication, uh, because it's costly when you have homozygote resistance. So in that case, resistance uh, may, may, um, may uh, reduce the survival fitness cost, so is may mosquito may may be less less uh, less uh, uh, less survive in the field in absence of insecticide and probably is better for us. So complicated uh, to me eh, to estimate the global impact of that uh, because it is different factors. Uh, susceptibility to a pathogen due to resistance that is not so clear, need more studies and uh, and the impact on fitness in the field. How the resistance really impact on the fitness. Uh, these uh, different uh, factors playing uh, to me. Uh, I agree. I would say to Daniel that we need to yeah. to study the, the effects on the fitness of the insects, of those uh, populations that uh, went through a bottleneck, mm -hmm. and also the um, doing uh, experimental infections in the lab and to see if they are as competent as the... Yeah, because as you say, the, 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 the beauty of the thing is more, uh, more resistance you are with strong selection pressure, we probably reduce the diversity mm -hmm. with mosquitoes that are really strong to resist to an insecticide, but it's loss is diversity. 
if this change is the environmental change in terms of insecticide pressure, in terms of climate change, in terms of environmental change, maybe this mosquito will not be adapted anymore because of the loss of, of genetics uh, um, allele and things. So that's, that's it's true. That's uh, what is an advantage in the situation may then be a disadvantage with uh, some changes on, on that. But I don't have any uh, lot of information on that. Uh, yes, okay. I think uh, address everything. There is a, ah, yeah. a Betty Manieri is asking um, a specific question that in Brazil, uh, by by the region, what the name of the insect uh, of the insecticide uh, uh, that we have recorded resistance? Yeah, maybe maybe we can answer yeah, this. The number, uh, the probably the number uh, of classes or insecticides. Yeah, the class of insecticides. Então, uh, uh, Betty. Uh, so we, we have recorded the resistance to pyrethroids, to uh, delta metrin, uh, alpha spermetrin, and also to organophosphate, temefoys, that he was used as larvicide, also to uh, malatile, piriproxifene, some, uh, some few populations uh, reduced. Uh, um, uh, susceptibility to periproxifene. And now we, have, uh, we are evaluating the new compounds, but we still don't know exactly because these compounds are super new, and we discussed it yesterday a lot. <laughs> we still don't know how exactly to, uh, to interpret, 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 interpret these results. And I will not <laughs> say that yes or not, if you, they are resistant or not, for these uh, new compounds. I think it's it. Ah, tem um ponto aqui, o Genta está me dizendo, se vocês fizerem a pergunta, eu vou ganhar um ponto na matéria. <risos> Quem fizer a pergunta? Ah, o Daniel já perguntou. Daniel já perguntou. Ah, o Daniel da turma, ele está aqui? Uh -huh. Por que você não... Ah. ah, o Daniel está aqui, olha. Ah. Muito obrigado pela pergunta, Daniel. Oh, era, era o que você queria? Você é de onde, Daniel? Yes. I'm from Spain. Ah, uh, my good. bad because I didn't formulate the question how I wanted. So, so indeed, do it now. Indeed, I wanted to ask uh, the loss of diversity in the ter in terms of, for example, uh, losing animals that could prey on mosquitoes could make that the populations of mosquitoes could rise and increase other infections. That's what I meant. No, can you say that again? The loss of what? Uh, the, lo predators. <laughs> the loss of predators, oh. for example. Like frogs? <laughs> yes, like in Costa Rica. <laughs> what happened in Costa Rica? Because of the fungal infection in frogs, there were more malaria cases. Uh, it's hard to, 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 to say as well because we have few evidence, a few, few data on that. But probably, as you said, uh, if you lose more predators, probably what will happen is an increase of the, the, the insects, especially uh, maybe at larval stage or adult stage. And probably the consequence is, is uh, more risk of transmission of the diseases. But yet, so far, the evidence is hard to, to, to show. Uh, relationship between uh, uh, same again we are in the abundance abundance of mosquitoes can increase with no risk of with no higher risk which is really the case for Aedes for example huh? many settings have shown an increase of Aedes indicators huh, when you measure and no higher risk of uh, dengue transmission and some places where the indicator was quite low and with epidemics so just to note, just to say that abundance of mosquitoes is not forcefully, especially for arboviral diseases, indicator that then uh, the, the we will have outbreaks because of the heterogeneity of, of transmission, uh, circulation of viruses, immunity of population. So re really complex. For malaria, I agree, it's a bit more, fun to me, eh, more direct, the evidence of density, abundance, uh, and, um, and transmission risk and the entomological inoculation rates has normally been well correlated with abundance, 
so in that case, yes, probably abundance of malaria vectors, probably higher high, higher risk. I guess I I, 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 I dengue or arboviral disease and, and dengue vector. We should we should uh, have more evidence probably for that. Time for one more question, at least. Então, todo mundo com fome, né, querendo almoçar? Tá bom? Deixa eu ver se tem mais alguma pergunta aqui. A quick question from Rafid. <laughs> What's the current status and future of WIN? We are discussing this today. <laughs> Since yesterday. Te falo depois, Rafi. <laughs> no, yeah, it has been uh, complicated to maintain a strong activity at global scale. Uh, first, COVID, uh, COVID did not help to maintain networking activities and things. Funding has been lacking a bit to maintain activities as we used to do uh, at international scale. Uh, what is why we are preferring? Uh, we are preferring. We are think working more at regional scale as we do for uh, South America is something pr probably better to do and uh, and uh, scientifically relevant uh, and and uh, probably better to target and to have. More commitments also uh, among the partners because they have joined a common of o o objective. Uh, while when you work at world scale, sometimes the interest of Mali may be different than Iran, that may be different than Singapore in terms of, of capacity, uh, research uh, priorities, and things. So here in the regions, I think uh, we have well, we have seen yesterday discussion mm -hmm. that we are having a consensus huh, about what we need, what we are missing, and what we want to do, and it's probably uh, also good chance to 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 achieve something, mm -hmm. and to so that's more that's to respond to Rafi. Também, então. Um, Quero dizer então para o pessoal que está lá no YouTube, também para vocês, que é, a Vansan, muito obrigado por essa excelente aula. Que bom que está gravado lá no YouTube, então a gente pode assistir de novo. Né? Essa aula vai, vai ficar lá disponível na nossa playlist lá. É, muito obrigado pela riqueza de informação e pela ampla... Né? Você falou vários capítulos de resistência inseticida numa aula só. Muito bom. É, muito obrigado, muitas graças a nos, nos outros, no, no, nos, nossos irmãos. É, thank you very much, merci beaucoup. Merci. É, desculpa para falar inglês e não português. Está muito bom. Que tá muito bom. Próxima, próximo ano eu. Mas nossos alunos precisam praticar o inglês também, né? Eles sabem disso. Ok, ah, muito bom, obrigado. Então, muito obrigado. Valeu, obrigado Marli, obrigado Maurício. Obrigado, Thiago, Maurício, Henrique, o pessoal que está aí filmando. Valeu mesmo. Muito bem, vamos almoçar então.